House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren. And um, on the other side of the country, we have Mr. David Rose Martino. <laughs> hey, Al. Back to the rose. Yeah, out to the rose. So how's it, you know, it's another. How is it? You didn't get part of that flood, did you? You're not in any of those floods. Uh, we're nearby. We got the uh, warning. But I haven't been out, so I don't know. We, we, <laughs> you could be underwater. underwater right now. Yeah. Well, then just, <laughs> just don't go out. <laughs> just, That's what I'm planning to do. Just wait and, and don't go anywhere. Just I hooked up on a boat to the house, and, you know. Yeah. You got too much water, and I got too much fire. <laughs> if you could get those together, that would be an amazing. Yeah, that'd be call, perfect. Call Mr. Basil's and get him on that. <laughs> get to work. Uh, well, now today we continue our week of thrillers, and um, we're going to be talking about the book Ice Angel, and it's an Alex Turner thriller. And uh, our guest today is the author of that book, Matthew Hart. Thank you for being here, Matthew. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, we've been talking to a lot of uh, thriller and fiction writers and stuff, and I, and I see this is kind of a, a, a jewel heist, sort of like uh, diamonds and all that stuff. Are, are you like a lot of writers, and you actually get into the role, and so you go out, did you try to steal some diamonds and <laughs> kind of get the feel for the characters? Or I'll tell you, when you're, when you're around the diamond business a lot, and you see a lot of really nice goods, really high-quality diamonds. The idea of stealing one is pretty hard to keep out of your head. <laughs> but I haven't actually pinched anything that, that I would be, well, it would be very unwise of me to admit it, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, we won't tell anybody. No. <laughs> and, the, and the listeners. Yeah, so don't worry about it. No, no big deal. And, uh, um, well, no, it's, it's just interesting because I think that um, – I've always dealt in nonfiction, and that's the writing that I do. So for me, it's always based on what people say and do and stuff. But you actually create characters in this, so you're you're creating the dialogue and, and how they interact and the situation. So I always find it interesting if um, how a writer like that gets into the characters, how they get into the people that they write in their books. Um and make it sound believable and real, you know? Did you have a particular process that you use if you're not up well, with stealing diamonds? Or do you... my, my background is as a reporter, and okay. my first book about diamonds was a nonfiction book called Diamond, The History of a Cold-Blooded Love Affair. And um, I wrote that in the wake of the big uh, diamond discovery in the Canadian Arctic. And I wrote about diamonds for many years for a number of magazines, and including uh, Rappaport Diamond Report here in New York and, and other, other magazines, Vanity Fair. And as I was always I, fascinated by diamonds and by, by people in the diamond world. Um, and, and it just, I, I always had in mind that it would be a great idea to write a novel set in the diamond world, in this case, I hope a series is, is the second in the series that I've written. Um, and uh, and in, in a way, maybe tell stories that I couldn't tell um, as a reporter. Because if I told them, I'd get sued for <laughs> some other difficulty. So with, with fiction, I, I think fiction has to be believable. And in this case, I... I I've, I've tried to make sure that the, the, the world in which I said it is believable. The plot's believable. The plot could happen. The plot has characters who could exist, maybe even characters that I've seen. And, um, and so that's just, it's a new way to write about a subject that already interested me and that I've been writing about for quite a few years. I would, I would imagine people in the diamond business are their own breed, like their own type of people. Just, it's just like any other business. I'm not, like, just picking on them, but I'm just – I'd imagine they have a certain type of characteristics and personalities that you don't come across an everyday um, meeting of people. So 
um, that 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 has to be real. So, do, do you do you, do you get some of this from people you've met or worked with, like, uh, or you've been around over the years reporting on diamonds? Did you sort of absorb some of their ways? I guess we'd say, and then that's kind of what you used in some of your characters. Well, I think you do absorb their way of thinking about about diamonds, about stones. There's really two main businesses in, in, in the diamond world. One is the trade, which is what most people come into contact with. And the trade is, by that I mean the retail trade, the retail and wholesale trade. And then the other part of the business is the mining business. And so very different types of characters inhabit those uh, businesses, but um, they they develop, a, they, there's a shared language, a sort of, um, a kind of a secret language, um, which is what I think the, the buyer is always up against. I think that, that in a, the, the buyer of a, of a diamond is always kind of on, on the back foot. You're always buying something that's a mystery, and you don't have the key to that mystery. You rely entirely on the person selling you that stone to interpret the mystery for you. And you rely on, on a certificate that is said to represent and describe the diamond. But really, the, the fine grades of color and clarity, uh, why one cuts better than another, um, why the difference in, in size can go up so much, um, like why, why, a, why is a five-carat diamond worth much, much more than five one-carat diamonds. And um, so I think that's the, 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 the diamond seller is always trying to relax the buyer, always trying to convince the buyer somehow that it's an open process, that it's something the buyer can understand. He'll explain everything to you. He'll unveil the mystery, and you'll then know everything about the diamond, which is, of course, nonsense because there's a lot you'll never know. And, um, and you have to trust the, the seller of the diamond. So um, anyway, so some of the language and the way that they think and their, the, the way, they, the way they, they anticipate their um, interaction with the public, that's all, that all interests me a great deal. And on the, on the mining side, I'm just interested in the geology that how do you discover a diamond deposit? Because they're very rare. And, and what goes into that? And then just the stupefying sums that people make when they do discover diamonds. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of money in this business. And, and size matters. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, so now, now this is part of it. Like you said, this is book two of the series, and we're talking Alex Turner thriller. So, who is Alex Turner? Well, Alex Turner is a treasury agent. So he works for this secretive, little-known part of the treasury that investigates certain kinds of transnational crime that involves diamonds. Um, diamonds are like cash without the serial number. So they're, that makes them very attractive to certain people. Um, for example, terrorists. It's well known that diamonds and gold too, but diamonds are, it's much, with diamonds, it's much easier to transport a very, very large sum of money in a very, very small package. I mean, a 10-carat diamond, that's just that's nothing. It's just a some tiny fraction of your fingernail, and it, and it could be worth $100,000. Hmm. Whereas a, a gold brick, a gold brick weighs a lot. It's about the size of a box of Kleenex, and it weighs probably about 27 pounds. That's pure gold. A diamond, you can get so much more value. So at any rate, it's quite popular. Uh, among certain kinds of um, criminal enterprises, uh, not just terrorists. So that's uh, that's one of the reasons that um, that's that's one of the sort of inroads that Alex Alex investigates. Alex knows the diamond business. He grew up in the diamond business. 
His dad was a diamond explorer, and he started out life as a, not exactly a diamond thief, but as someone who, who bought dodgy goods. He bought, in fact, st diamonds stolen from mines, and that's how he made his living. He, he resold them. And as a very young man, he got blackmailed into working for the CIA uh, by people who knew what he was up to and wanted his skills. And then from the CIA, he ends up in the Treasury, and this opens the whole sort of uh, entrance into transnational crime that, and, uh, that allows me to, uh, and geopolitical action generally, that, uh, that I write in. Hmm. So how do you decide what kind of character Alex Turner is going to be? Like when you're putting this together, so you, do, do you want him to be a good person, a bad person? Um, how does that process happen for you? Well, that's a very good question. I like uh, for me, he's neither of those things. He's he's a he sometimes does bad things, but it's in the service of an overall larger project. But Alex works for the government. So the government's projects, the government's reasons for doing things aren't always invariably the, the kinds of reasons that we would approve of. So he's quite cynical about the motives of the people he works for, rightly so. Nonetheless, it's his job, and it's a cynical world, a world in which there are a lot of very real, very bad people. And it's his job to help frustrate the aims of such people. Mm. Where, do, where do you, um, when you write a character like Alex or anybody else in the book, do you sort of, um, do you actually hear them or see them or feel them or do you have a relationship with your characters, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I feel I do have a relationship with with Alex, and it's it's very difficult to write dialogue unless you can imaginatively get inside the head of the person uh, who's of the voice. Right. Whether it's a 19 year old girl, as Alex's daughter is in the 19 year old woman, I guess I should say, as Alex's daughter is in the um, in Ice Angel, or uh, Alex himself. Um, or his boss. Um, so I, I think by getting inside, by understanding how he thinks, his motives, and how he'll react to something, it 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 enables it enables me to better employ him to explore the themes I want to explore, themes of betrayal. Um, and the contest among nations like that. How was it for you to um, uh, transition from uh, writing uh, nonfiction to writing fiction? And, and do you have, uh, is, is the one, do you feel more comfortable in one than the other? Well, I mean, I'm trying to write fiction now. So uh, other than the odd short piece of journalism, that's what I stick to. Um, the first book was quite a challenge because I, I thought that once I worked out a plot, I had it. And then all I had to do was kind of fill it in with guns, add guns and sex. And I, just, <laughs> like, I was there. Perfect. But I found that it was much more difficult. And, uh, and the first book took me a long time. I had to break away and do other things. Um, it was taking me so long. The first in the series was The Russian Pink, which came out last year. Um, and um, so it, it takes a long time to, to get used to the rhythms of fiction, to force yourself to into a kind of a production schedule, um, to understand what the challenge is going to be, uh, when to stop writing for the day, what you should kind of how you should position yourself for the morning. Um, it's quite a bit different from journalism and, and street reporting because you can always empty the notebook out. 
And even if it gets an in it, you always know what it's going to be. The quote has to be as it is, and you know what your what your aim is. The, your aim is to report the story, but you don't always understand what your aim is in fiction. You, you, your aim is to complete the complete the you know dot all the i's and cross the t's and have a satisfying a satisfying story for the reader that hopefully um, conveys some kind of message and leaves a feeling that. You know, uh, uh, something's been solved, and, and there's a completeness to it. But you don't always under. I found myself, at any rate, that I didn't really understand where exactly I was going until I got into it, and I changed direction a lot. So there's an awful lot of rewriting. You find that this just isn't going to go the way I've conceived it. Maybe I can't have a 15 carat blue diamond here because that's just not going to work. I can't account for it. So I'm going to have to make it. You know, three matching D flawless four carat pairs or whatever. Um, so I found I had to change it. And also the characters change. And sometimes you think you can put a character in a scene and you can't put the character in that scene. They just won't go. They won't do as they're told. They have a mind of their own. That was the most interesting thing for me, finding out the degree of agency that characters develop. And in a sense, you have to create that and understand it and then follow the character into the plot. That's the only safe way to go. So characters have um, surprised you while you were writing. They absolutely have. When you're writing about international things, you know, including the Chinese billionaire and you've got Russia and and all this stuff, do, do you sort of... Does that put you on um, a little bit of an, an edge, or do you have to be careful about what people will think? Well, I think the biggest worry about writing about um, real events is that they'll have completely transpired differently by the time your book comes out, if they're too identifiable. Or there'll have uh, been some, some development that just makes them makes it absurd. So I think uh, I take um, sort of a fuel and energy from international affairs and certain geopolitical situations, but uh, I don't like to like map out the plot by certain events. But one of my characters, this uh, Chinese twin, female Chinese twin, Ji Mei. Um, some readers might think of a there, there's a there's a Chinese superstar businesswoman, you know, mega billionaire, who's under arrest in Vancouver right now. Mm -hmm. Her name is Meng Wanzhou, right? And she's the chief financial officer of Huawei, the Chinese Titanic communications company the company that the United States government is bent on frustrating. And she was coming through Vancouver on her way elsewhere when the American government ordered, well, not ordered, they have an extradition treaty with Canada. So they requested her apprehension on an extradition warrant, and the Canadians really had no choice. They arrested her. She's under house arrest now and has been for a couple of years in a mansion in Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so... I put a character like that, including one who was arrested and being held on an extradition warrant, into the book just because it was, it, it's just a dramatic situation. Here's this person who's powerful and still wielding power, yet constrained. And it also allowed me to discuss, you know, what was the motive that led to it? Does the United States government truly believe that she is guilty of uh, a fraud uh, because she neglected to inform one of her bankers that a certain company had a, a relationship with an Iranian company, which is what's, what's alleged. That the relationship isn't alleged, it's factually true, but that this constituted a fraud. Um, and was there purpose to force, as Trump himself said, President Trump at the time, seemed to admit in an interview that they had her there 
and they, in order to pressure the Chinese to give the United States a better, a better trade relationship. But the consequences for the United States are very are nothing. Uh, China's ability to hurt the United States is zero, but it's not as great as China's ability to hurt Canada, and that's who really took it in the ear. So, this allowed me to develop a uh, a conflict in the far north, in in fact the Arctic diamond fields, a stupefyingly rich area that many people have never heard of, but that I visited and, and wrote and written about. It allowed me to set something up there that's believable and credible. Because we all know that the Chinese want to establish a toehold in the strategic north. They want, they want to be able to say, by the time the ice melts and the shipping season is so much longer, we too have a right to these resources. So my plot's believable, and I think there, there are lots of extravagant characters. And, and it's, it's a good fun read, I hope. And um, but so it's it's in a kind of it's in a believable universe, and I think then this this led leads some sort of it gives it a credibility, and I think I think a, a richness that the reader can share in. When you're when you're putting these together, like this is book two, do you outline these books ahead of time? Do you sort of know where you're going to go with the characters and the and the basic story, and then put it together? Like, do you have other books already outlined in the series, or is this just kind of a do it as you go? I think you have to have an outline, because you have to know when to reveal. You know, it's all about the reveals. When to reveal what's happening, when to make that, that, that you know, that hairpin turn. Um... Having said that, I've found it impossible to completely map the story and stick to it. Because again, I find you right along, in this case I'm working on the third right now. I wrote about, well, I think it's 168 pages. And then I just, <laughs> it's, and I had a map right at the end. But at 168 pages, I just kind of crashed into a brick wall because the characters weren't going to go any further and along the path that I had that I'd laid out. I they they kind of developed along the way, and and just so I, I had to stop, go back, you know, bang my head against the wall for a while, pace, um, <laughs> look out the window at the garbage truck, uh, you know, all of the all of the. Um, you know, check the fridge to see if the cold pizza is still there. Eat the cold pizza. <laughs> pace it around, and then and then just sit down and try and say, no, no, this isn't going to work. I've got to rehack it. So, yeah, you have to have an idea. You have to know where where you're going, but you may have to redesign the map. For me, speaking for myself, um, I, I would be very envious somebody who could just lay it all out and then stick to it. Yeah. I, 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 but I wonder if sometimes um, when you're doing that, you look back at it or you, and, and you have to make a lot of changes then, or do you have to, I mean, for because of something you've done in a previous scene or a previous book, when you're writing sequels like this, I, 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 you have to really keep it organized. Absolutely. Um, I find that... Um, that I, you know, reach a certain point. Let's say I, I've, I've, I've got this great idea for, a, um, for a, a plot twist that I didn't have written down, but that all of a sudden the characters are at this point and I think, no, this would be great. This is too good for this. This is perfect. And you write it in and then you think, no, wait a minute. This has got to be set up a little ways back. So then you do have to go back and make that change. And then that change, of course, will mean that you have to go back and make another change. And sometimes it just means like you have to get rid of a character. Um, so I, I do find that. I find that I have to change. Uh, yeah. Constantly revising. Any yeah. revision makes you revise the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Um, 
and now you know you know a lot about the the, the world of diamonds and stuff. Um, I wonder if if there's also sometimes that you want to, I guess maybe educate the readers about some things, and maybe there's um, some sort of a subtext that you want to get across to people. Well, I mean, certainly the reader has to know a certain amount about the diamond world to follow. So a character, the characters have to explain it. And mostly it's Alex Turner who does the explaining because he's not only the son of a, a renowned diamond explorer, his father is this, this um, well, really this almost legendary diamond uh, explorer, well, diamond scientist, really. And, um, and Alex grew up in diamond exploration camps in Africa. And um, so sometimes I like to put in, if, if, if so let me just go back. If, if the plot is going to rely upon some technical aspect, then the reader has to get up to speed to a certain extent on that, on that technical aspect of either diamond prospecting or maybe diamond cutting or something like that. So you have to find a way to put that in. But I enjoy that a lot. And I think a lot of, a lot of thrillers do that. A lot of, um, a lot of thrillers are, are really rooted in the world in which the, the characters, in which the fiction operates. And, um, so that's a task. That's something you have to keep in mind, I find. Uh, as part of the sort of signposting, so that the reader, the reader always knows where she is. Bill character here, the treacherous lover, <laughs> the <laughs> Russian diamond thief. Um, so, where does that character come from? Well, she's a composite. Um, she's known in the uh, diamond world as Slav Lily, and she is a Slav. She's a Russian. She grew up in the in the great Russian diamond producing area in Siberia. Uh, Russia is the biggest diamond producer in the world. In fact, this year I think their production is probably about 40 million carats. Um, it's not the most valuable production, but it's very, very, very good. And they're very, very big players. And she became a diamond thief uh, by really stealing from the diamond sorting operation of this huge diamond mining apparatus in the far east of, of Russia. And, um, and I like her because she, she brings a complete immorality to the, to the game. Like she, she had a very difficult life as a child. Her parents died. She was an orphan. She was abused. Um, and so, she separated herself from the, you know, her straightened circumstances by becoming an extremely accomplished diamond thief on a large scale. So not the sort of person, not the, not the second story man or the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the David Niven or whatever uh, character on the Côte d'Azur. She's, uh, she's something else entirely. She, she stole from the sorting operation and she stole huge amounts of rush, rough, I got a big important, rough diamonds, and managed to sell them. So, um, and then she, she rose through the operation and ended up in Antwerp, where Al Rosa, the Russian, uh, the Russian diamond trading company, has, a, has an office. And I call them by something else, so that I can't be sued by Al Rosa. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so, Alex Turner... In the course of trying to stop the flow of blood diamonds, um, compromises her and threatens her with the kind of the kind of um, the kind of uh, punitive action that only someone working for the United States Treasury can really visit on someone, like saying, "We'll go to your bank." And you'll be blacklisted because they'll do what we say. So at any rate, he compromises her and he flips her. So he now has Slav Lily, 
working for the Russian oligarchs, who now control a lot of the flow of diamonds, because they control everything in Russia. They certainly diamonds and gold. Um, and she, uh, so she's his, she's his, his sort of, his um, mole inside this extremely corrupt, violent, and super rich transnational criminal world. And um, however, she's been compromised by him. So how honest is she going to be? They become lovers, <laughs> by the way. Their, their, uh, their joint enterprise of espionage uh, erupts into a love affair. Well, the first night it erupts into a love affair. So it's just they, they have this volcanic love affair. And at the same time, she betrays him. She's not altogether honest. Why would she be? And this is always the risk with a double. Is she a double or, in fact, a triple? And, um, and Alex himself hasn't been entirely straightforward with her. So going between the two of them, it's kind of a two-hander. That going between the two of them, there's this, there's this, let's just say they each deceive each other. Would you say that the, the diamonds themselves, or maybe even the, uh, the political situation, be, become characters unto themselves within the story? Oh, absolutely, because diamonds do become characters. Um, in my first book, uh, the Russian, my first thriller, The Russian Pink, um, it's a pink diamond that is at the heart of the story, this, this, this huge 1,500-carat this pink diamond. It gets cut down to 400 and something carats. But I mean, just a, a, an absolutely, just an, a mind boggling jewel worth almost impossible to, to set a price on. Um, and then in, in Ice Angel, it's the, it's the hunt for a diamond deposit that, that is really the, becomes almost, almost, it becomes so absorbing. It, it, the characters are hunting for like the mythical beast mm. almost, and people really do get like like so absorbed. Prospectors become are very driven people, and um, and and I I try to bring I try to bring this out. I mean, in the diamond, like I wrote a long piece for Vanity Fair on this diamond discovered in Botswana a few years ago. Called La Sede La Rona. That's what they. That's what they ended up calling it. That it means. It means our light in the Tswana language, which is the majority language in Botswana. And this was. It was this kind of eleven hundred carat diamond, eleven hundred and six carat white. I, I. I was so taken with this. I flew over to see it once I got their permission, the company's permission, and signed an NDA. I flew over and saw and handled this diamond which is about the size of a fist. Um, this just colossal, completely engrossing. Diamond. I mean, to put a loop up to the, 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 the face of that diamond and peer in and see the depths of that and wonder how big it'll be cut and engage, enter, like fall. You almost, you topple into a diamond. You topple into this, this crystal opportunity it's it's a, it's just it's what will you get from the diamond that diamond the, and i followed it until it's well not its sale i followed it into its its failure at auction because the miner decided to auction the diamond instead of the usual um sort of procedure which is to sell it to a dealer uh, a middleman, if you will, a cutter, a diamantier, a diamond a diamond expert, somebody who's probably maybe a big jeweler, uh, who will polish it and who has a customer. He'll have a customer before he buys it. Or he'll have a syndicate to buy it and they'll all have customers. Instead of that, they thought the diamond was so, it gained fame so quickly. There were stories everywhere. They're on the front page of the New York Times, everything. Biggest diamond discovered since the Cullinan, which is, you know, which produced the great star of Africa, the sort of the, the biggest diamond in the crown jewels. This is the biggest since then, 1106 carats. 
So they thought, we'll auction it. We'll auction the diamond, the rough. So they, they took it around. They, there was a big presentation here in New York down at Sotheby's. Sotheby's was the auctioneer. And I, I was at the presentation here. People, tons of people showed up. And then, but at the auction, there was a campaign against that diamond. A, ca a whispering campaign against the Lesedi. By whom? By the diamond trade. By the people who were bypassed, who thought, wait a minute, we can't let a diamond miner get away with this. They're not going to sell rough directly to the customer, and the customer is going to, you know, we're not going to get into a bidding war. We're not going to bid. And if we don't bid, who will? And they started putting about all kinds of rumors like, I don't know if it's completely, the top color in diamonds is D. So you start at D, that's the best color of white diamond. And then E, F, G, H, that's all going down. So this had certificates, the rough had certificates from three different people saying, likely a D and definitely a D. And so it, it had, there was, a, there was a lot of opinion that it was a D color. But these guys started, well, one, one man in particular, and I won't name him, started, told me, you know, I think I see a little yellow in there. I think I see a tiny bit of yellow. You can't tell until you cut it. He had a huge reputation in the business. He'd sold many of the most famous diamonds of the 20th and 21st century. So, comes auction night. And I was at that auction. Six o'clock in a summer in June evening in London. And down Bond Street to Sotheby's in and they have the whole place was all decked out. He had these people in tails holding silver trays with champagne, handing it out to the guests, and then they had this great big dog and pony show where the auctioneer made a speech about I've never seen anything like this. The diamond is the most and you could view the diamond beforehand, too. They had it all lit up and just gorgeous. And we sat down. The auction opens. Nothing. Nothing. There was not, there were a few bids, but just about everybody thinks the bids were the auction house trying to get it going. Wow. The diamond had a reserve on it of 61 million, and it didn't make its reserve. They had to what they call buy it in. So what happened? The, the, well, the president of the, of the company, whose idea it had been not to sell it in the trade, he lost his job. Um, the, uh, the diamond was eventually bought by a, you know, a, a very distinguished diamanteur. And, uh, you can see his name is Lawrence Graf, and if you go online at Graf and type in Lasedi, L-E-S-E-D-I, Lasedi La Rona, you'll see all the diamonds he cut out of. He cut out of it. I think he cut about 20 diamonds out of it. The largest is a more than 300 carat D flawless round cut. It's just, I mean, it'll totally knock your eyes out. A diamond like that. You can't look at a diamond like that and follow a diamond like that without having a kind of like like a fan feeling. It's like it's like following the you know following the Patriots or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you you want this diamond to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> Everybody thought that diamond would break a hundred million dollars at that auction, and certainly the company thought it. And instead, nothing. It fell on its face. Um, I felt, I mean, I went back to my hotel just thinking, I just felt bleak. Uh, also, I had to rewrite my story because I had my story <laughs> completely written, ready to go, and only the sale price to be filled in. So I had, I had to do a U-turn on the story, which was like I had about two days to do that. And, um, yeah, we got a good story out of it, but not a very happy story. Um, in some cases, a better story because it really, that diamond was assassinated. And I think that in the diamond, when you write about the diamond business, and even writing thrillers set in the diamond business, you're writing about that business. You have to be in some way writing about it. You have to write about characters, of course. First and foremost, 
No book is ever about diamonds or gold or whatever like that. If it's fiction, it's about people. But this is the world they operate in. And I think there's some of that fire, some of that that interest, that kind of that, that allure that diamonds have that helps to drive the book. You're, you're looking for the, what's the outcome? You know, are, if it's not, are they going to get the diamond? It's, are they going to find the diamond mine? And even in that, in that search, where they use, where people hunt by looking for a certain kind of mineral associated with diamonds, in this case, a garnet, a very purple kind of a garnet called a G10 that's very rich in chrome, because where diamonds are formed in the diamond stability field in the upper mantle, the molten upper mantle, there's a lot of chrome. And it's known that garnets form in the same conditions as diamonds. So garnets are more numerous than diamonds. So that's why prospectors look for these garnets, because they're easier to find. And if you find them and perform certain chemical analysis on them, they point to a diamond. So you, you see what I'm saying. They, you see the garnet, and the garnet jumps out from the gravel. Or maybe it's this, this other mineral called an ilmenite, which is sort of coal black, or a chrome diopside, which is beautiful emerald green. You look for these things, and they think, wow, that's great. But they're thinking diamond mine. Mm. Uh, so when you, when you um, see the world of diamonds, do you think it's portrayed pretty well on TV, or like through Hollywood and, and stories and, uh, uh, that you see on, you know, I guess Netflix nowadays and stuff like that? Is it, is, is it pretty accurate or would people be surprised about some things? Oh, I think people would be very surprised. Um, no, I don't think it's... Uh... I think uh, I think people generally don't know much about the diamond business. Um, however, they can they can cure that condition by buying my books. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, uh, then they'd be all fixed. And I'm not keeping it secret anymore. No. But, um, <laughs> they. Uh, yeah. No. No. I don't think people have a very good idea. And of course, the whole diamond story now is complicated by lab-grown diamonds so-called lab-grown diamonds, which is, um, I mean, you know, factory-growing, you might as well say. But, um, but and they're, they're very nice. There are a lot of those that are, they're, they're much better now than they used to be. But I'm not so interested in those as I am in, in natural diamonds because, you know, there you have the rarity factor. It can't be grown. There's the, the excitement of the discovery. And the diamond world itself, like now China, China's huge in diamonds now. Not just synthetics. They are the biggest producer of synthetics in the world and nobody will ever catch them. Uh, but they're big diamond consumers. Well, they consume everything, don't they? Yeah. BMWs, French wine, furs, and, and diamonds. And there are big polishing concerns in China too. Uh, mostly run by the Indians. The biggest diamond polishing country in the world is India. Uh, and that's something that only happened in the last, say, 40 years of, of the 20th century. They started by polishing tiny, tiny, tiny little diamonds, the kind that used to be industrial diamonds. And they would polish them into tiny little jewels. You, had, you need a loop to see these. And when you look at them, they've got all the facets, like 58 facets on them. Only India could afford the labor, you know, to polish something into because labor costs are so low. Right, right. To polish a tiny little thing that's four one hundredths of a carat into a jewel that's then used really only for brightening jewelry. I mean, you can't, you couldn't stick it in a ring. But and and the but they've developed a, a kind of diamond culture. Well, they have a very old diamond culture. Look at the, the whole diamond, which was. Uh, that, that was that's that's for India, right? Um, and uh, so it just you, when you open one door in diamonds, it leads to another door. I started as a reporter writing about that big diamond discovery in Canada when the diamonds were discovered in the Arctic, 
And, and then I found out I'd already written about gold, so I kind of thought I understood mining. Guess again. If you have a gold discovery, all you have to do is figure out how much gold there is in the ground, and you know what it's worth. Because an ounce of gold is worth this much. But what's a diamond worth? That's like, at the time I was writing my book, De Beers had something like 14,000 separate categories into which they, they would break diamonds, each with its own price. So that's the size, color, shape, shape of the rough, because the rough is, has to be polished. So is it easy to polish or hard to polish? What's the yield going to be? Um, and uh, it was a very, you just find that it's an endlessly complex business. Right. And, um, and it used to be all, when you'd go to Antwerp, it would be mostly Jewish people on the street. Hassets, particularly, on, on the street and in the diamond bourses, four different bourses, just in that tiny little diamond quarter in Antwerp with oceans of diamonds flowing through it constantly. Now, there's just as many Indians in Antwerp as there are Hasidic traders. And you should see what the street looks like when those two guys get going. <laughs> it's just like, they, I mean, Talk about a talk about bargaining or haggling or whatever you want to call it. Um, but that's the diamond world. And as I yeah. say, you open one door and you're in another world and you just start to get used to that and you realize, oh, I didn't see that door. And you open that door and you're in another order of complexity. That's just what makes it so beguiling. Mm. So now let's talk, um, where do people find you uh, or find your book? Um, do you have a website? Well, I do have a website, um, matthewhart.net. And um, uh, the book is, uh, well, you can get it. Uh, you can certainly order it now. Yeah. Um, it's available at, you know, any of the, any of the places that, that people usually order books. Any of the big online booksellers mm. will certainly have it, and so it's it's not hard to get. We're trying not to hide it. Oh, well, do they get a free diamond with purchase? <laughs> <laughs> Just you know, it'd be a good sales thing. Um, it, it, so, how did the pandemic affect the diamond world? Or did it? Did it? Or it does it? How does that work? Does it interfere? Well, I guess with it affected the diamond world in that the um, you know people weren't going into stores. Right, right. That's a that's a big effect, but, but it, and it did hit it very hard for a while. But diamonds recover, and last year started just at the end of last year started to really go up again. And now that I mean, diamond prices are very high now. The diamond diamond world is doing very well right now. Polished uh, polished prices are really great. That's what I imagine rough prices are too, and. Um, and so are lab growing. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah well. seems to be a big demand. And, and, you, and you mentioned, like, before, you said um, blood diamonds. Now, is that still a big problem, like what uh, blood diamonds? No, it's not. No. And it hasn't been for a very long time. And even at the height of the blood diamond story, blood diamonds didn't constitute a very large part of the, of the diamond uh, business. There was mostly Angola and Sierra Leone. And I mean, I, I was in Angola during the Diamond Wars, or, or Blood Diamond Wars, if you want to call them that. And um, yeah, they were very, they were horrible characters. People were enslaved. They were, you know, incredibly unprincipled men. I traveled in with one of them, a British mercenary by the name of Simon Mann, uh, who um, who was involved with a a mercenary army called Executive Outcomes, based not sort of between, in an area of South Africa called the Midrand, between not, not too far from uh, Johannesburg. And um, we went in and visited some uh, a Canadian-owned property that his company had bought and were then promoting. They, they, had, a, they had a Canadian stock market listing. Um, but uh, blood diamonds didn't constitute a huge... Uh, very large percentage of all diamonds. It just got a lot of the press. Um, because most diamonds, 
are industrially mined in huge pits. Diamonds are diamonds are come up from the the deep earth from a hundred miles down in a kind of extinct. They're found in a sort of extinct volcano, the volcano that once harvested them from the upper mantle, uh, and that they're called pipes. Those deposits are known as pipes, and most diamonds come from these enormous pipes in Botswana, slightly smaller ones in Canada, but Canada is a very large producer, and mammoth pipes in the in the far east of Russia. And they're mined industrially. And uh, they're they're an industrial product. And you know the people who mine them are have very good paying jobs and generally lots of benefits in Canada, a huge amount of the uh, well not a huge amount but you know, a substantial amount of the of the revenue or government revenue goes directly to the indigenous people uh, in the area where the diamonds are found, uh, and then uh, and also employs a lot of them. So, and in Botswana, I mean, diamonds maintain the whole sort of Garden of Eden style of life that Botswana enjoys. Mm. Um, that's entirely down to diamonds. Right. Right. I've never been to the far east of Russia, but I think the diamond, the mining jobs there are sought after. So right. that's where most diamonds come from. Blood diamonds was a horrible, ghastly, miserable thing that said a lot about the diamond business, particularly the trade, that the only question anybody will ever ask about a diamond when it shows up in a place like Antwerp or Tel Aviv or New York City is... How much do you want for it? They don't care where it came from. Hmm. And th that was the that was the scandalous thing about the about that uh, right about right. that story. That was the yeah the sad thing about it. We, that everyone knew, and they were buying it. All the big companies were buying those diamonds. They knew where they came from. They could come in with certificates saying they were from Gambia. Well, guess what? There isn't a diamond pipe in the entire country, every or a diamond river. We all knew where those diamonds were coming from. Yeah, and you gotta, you can't trust those Canadians. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I don't trust one as far as I can throw. Them, so, anyway, um, well, it's been a great conversation. Uh, the book we've been uh, focusing on is Ice Angel. And uh, our guest has been the author, Matthew Hart. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks, Matthew. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.